I'd like to welcome you to the third annual evening of Deaf and Disability Arts and Culture. This year christened Art with Attitude. My name is Duncan McKinley and I have the distinct pleasure of serving as your Master of Ceremonies for the next little while. It's an incredible honor and a privilege to be asked to direct such a valuable event. Showcasing all of the talents and gifts you're about to see is indeed a thrill. The true value and marvel of this evening, however, is not any one act in particular. It's the strength of being we will all be treated and witnessed to by each person who graces this stage. You'll see many a difference in this room during our time together over the next few hours. However, something you will not see on this stage is a single victim. Tonight's show is made possible by the Royal Bank of Canada. One year ago, this company kindly provided a major grant to Ryerson, enabling them to establish the Ryerson RBC Foundation Institute for Disability Studies, Research, and Education. Say that three times fast. I think that it's very important that uh, after this evening, we, we let the RBC know that uh, this room not only filled to the hilt, but it filled with people practically running in the field of seats. I think that... It's, uh, it's pretty important they know the fruits of, their, the, of the seeds they planted. At this time, and if you'll kindly permit me the indulgence, I'd like to introduce myself a little more fully to you. I have Tourette syndrome, and have had Tourette since I was about seven, but didn't get formally diagnosed until age 19. I'm a shaking and a bucking, what's wrong with me? I had these urges so no one can see. What's going on and where's it coming from? It sure was nice to hear I have Tourette's syndrome. Let's twitch. Everybody, let's twitch. Who really cares if the neighbors snitch? We all do the Tourette twitch. When I first read about Tourette's... Thank you. <laughs> When I first read about Tourette's in the Nan Landers column 10 years ago, I knew immediately, that's me. But after so much conflict for so many years, my family was doubtful. My parents, teachers, doctors, well, they all said, stop acting out of line, it's all in your head. Then I went to get a neurological screen. They told me I have really weird dopamine. Let's twitch. Everybody, let's twitch. Who really cares if the neighbors snitch? We all do the Tourette twitch. As I began to... <laughs> As I began to read the formal research and medical knowledge on Tourette's syndrome, I experienced a lot of anger and depression. That is, until I began to learn about the other side of the coin. I bark, nod, swear, blink, and get really mad. But that makes it sound as if it's all bad. I'm also funny, nice, smart, creative as can be. So come on and do the Tourette twitch with me. Let's twitch. Everybody, let's twitch. Who really cares if the neighbors snitch? Oh, we all do the Tourette twitch. With increasing self-comfort and belief in myself came increased ticks. I was no longer ashamed to be fully and completely me. There's always some more on that'll laugh in your face. You lose your self-esteem with them on your case. Rather than letting them get to your goose, say at least I have Tourette's. What's your excuse? Let's twitch. Everybody, let's twitch. Who really cares if the neighbors snitch? We all do the Tourette twitch. Now, here I am, becoming a psychologist, running a presentation business, and a website at lifesatwitch.com, and serving as your humble master of ceremonies. Standing hand in hand with so many others who are doing so many things and celebrating so many of their own differences. We're doctors, artists, teachers, nothing's holding us back. We really make our mark with such a lively pack. I'm so glad I've got it because it makes me so unique. Life must really suck when you're boring and meek. Let's twitch. Everybody, let's twitch. Who really cares if the neighbors bitch? We all do the two red twitch. Thank you. The poster emailed to me uh, about tonight uh, tells me that I'm shameless. I don't know where they got that from. But I guess if, if I'm shameless, that would make me uncensored by neurology and unabashed by nature. I would, I would say having a Tourette MC is a pretty risky thing when you think that the common symptom that's associated with Tourette syndrome is, of course, swearing involuntarily. So, you know. <laughs> now, mind you, okay, just to, just to put you at ease, I, I don't have that particular symptom, but I do have a lot of different motor tics. And, and what I'm concerned about with that tonight is I'm afraid that, you know, I don't know American Sign Language, but I may be, like, telling people in inadvertently that their mothers wear army boots or something with my different tics. So my apologies in advance. That's m more than probably a sufficient amount of monkeying around on my part. 
So without further ado, please let me share with you the first of our acts, entitled The Friendly Spike Theatre Band. For over a decade, this feisty theatre, named after two dogs, has served Toronto's marginalized communities. They are a company working to improve artistic content for ideas which individuals and communities usually overlook. Using the context of theatre, the company works with communities, helping them express their message. The creative team, a mixed group, uh, the creative team is a mixed group comprised of institutional abuse survivors. As well as play creation, Friendly Spike offers a season of plays and events, an excerpt from one we will enjoy this evening. The Girls of Grandview, a collectively written play, is based on the experience of survivors of the Grandview Training School for Girls. The play highlights the ripple effect that was started by Grandview women and consequently tells other women's stories. The play was dramaturged by Ruth Ruth and Ken Innes. The Girls of Grandview will be playing at the Tarragon Extra Space from July 20th to August 4th, uh, Tuesday to Saturday at 8 p.m. and Sunday at 2.30 p.m. The theater is wheelchair accessible and advanced tickets are $5 or $7 at the door. This presentation tonight has been made possible by the City of Toronto uh, through the Arts, Toronto Arts Council, 21st Century Femme from CIUT, Parkdale Community Legal Services, The Body Shop, and the Friendly Spike Theatre Angels. So, without any further ado... A provincially run reform school with a long history of cruelty towards its boards. Closed in 1976 in a storm of controversy that alleged the staff and guards as perpetrators of crimes of physical, mental, and sexual abuse. Perhaps the government of Ontario felt that by closing the door to this institution, all the crimes that took place there would be forgotten. Fourteen years later, the girls, now women, were beginning to comprehend the seriousness and magnitude of what had happened to them. In 1991, two women made history by coming out and officially charging their former abusers at Grandview. One act of courage led to another, and in the end, an astounding 300 women made official complaints against their former surrogate parents, the staff at Grandview, for horrible crimes. In 1992, a number of women who were seeking help formed the Grandview Survivors Support Group. Police investigations were initiated, resulting in 119 criminal charges against nine individuals. However, most of the charges were stayed. Only one man, a former guard, served jail time. And the accursed senior staff, Thomas Loker and Dr. Robert Ross, got off scot-free Please note the initial police report from the inquiry made in 1976, the one that closed the joint down, has still not been released. Thanks to the tenacity of the Grand New Survivors Support Group, the government provided the victims with a settlement called the Healy Pact, along with an official apology from the Attorney General on behalf of the province of Ontario. That's right. Let's begin. Meet Chris Kelly. Like many Grandview survivors, she is also an incest survivor. Jessie? When her social worker, Jessie Rubino, suggests that she participate in the peer support group, she is faced with a dilemma. Dr. Barnett to emergency. Dr. Barnett to emergency. Okay, you're safe. <laughs> 
probably think I'm crazy. No. I'm not crazy, Jesse. No, I know Jessie. that. I know that. I'm sorry, okay? Hey, 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 don't you be sorry. I mean, what your uncle did to you is not your fault. Oh, really? Well, that's not what other people tell me. I get told things like, well, young girls can be pretty sexy, you know, and they wear awfully short skirts, and men can't be expected to control themselves. Who would say something stupid like that? My former boyfriend. Yeah. I remember, you remember when the news broke about those young guys who were being abused at St. John's? Well, I was watching it with my former boyfriend, and I said, I know how much that hurts. It happened to me. Okay. So my former boyfriend says, nah, that's different, eh? Girls were made for that. Yeah, you just can't win, you know? So, what do you want to talk to me about? Well, starting next week, the clinic is going to be offering a peer support group for incest survivors. Would you like to take part? No. Okay. Well, what would I be doing? Well, uh, helping other women. How am I going to help anybody, offering Jesse? Peer Chris, you're the expert, not me. Look, they got problems. Let them deal with it, okay? I got enough problems of my own. All right. I just wanted you to think about it. What is it that you didn't understand? I said no. Think about it. That's all I ever do is think about it. And if I'm ever able to stop thinking about it, I've always got these written reminders on my arms. What do you want me to say to them? Oh, it's all right. Get on with your life. Put it behind you. <laughs> Jesse, all I ever do is think about what a waste my life has been. What do you want me to say to them? Better luck next time? <laughs> Shit, that only works if you're a Buddhist. <laughs> it's not funny. <clears throat> you know, it's taken me all this time to tell you my problems, to, to, to disclose. And now you want me to share them. Like, like what? Like, like... Like we're talking over a fence here? Look, I am perfectly grounded, thank you very much. I am finally in control of my life, and you want to throw me back into the sewer. No. Look, they got problems, let them deal with it, okay? Shame. More shame? You want me to go through more shame? No, no, I want you to think about working within a group of women who have gone through similar horrific experiences. I mean, nobody understands your pain better than somebody who's gone through it. Chris, <laughs> you're not alone. Maybe. Maybe what? Maybe I'm not alone. Good. Look, uh, I gotta go. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I got single moms. Uh, And maybe, maybe I can help. When graduate student Jennifer Elliott, who is writing her thesis on the Grandview Training School for Girls, entitled Devolutionary and Microcultural Actualities Generated Endogenously During Incarceration in Grandview Training School for Girls, <laughs> meets up with Ronnie. Just Ronnie. Come again. Devolutionary, Devolutionary and, and microcultural cultural actualities, actualities generated, generated endogenously, endogenously during, during incarceration, incarceration in Grandview Grand 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 Training Grand School for Girls, damaged, damaged in Grandview. Grand yeah. She is inspired to come to terms with her personal experience with trauma. You know, you helped me break my silence. Oh, what do you mean? I mean, you all did. All the Grandview women coming forward and speaking out helped me break my silence. Spit it out. Well, I was 19, unsure of myself, kind of insecure, you know. I used to spend most of my time reading fashion magazines and trying to look 
sexy and gorgeous, so I'd get all the things they promised. Like love, adoration, maybe even fame. He was our next door neighbor. He was my parents' friend. He had this beautiful wife and three adorable kids. And the whole family used to be over at our place for coffee and dinner all the time. One day I was, um, I was home alone. And um, I, I'd always thought that he was this really nice family guy. And I, I never, but he did. He raped me. And then he said it was my fault for wearing all those short skirts and tight top. job, one of those jobs where they don't allow you to think. You can't think. And I gave up and life. And then one day, on the news, Grandview broke. And I started watching you guys. I started listening to the stories. Like, remember that one girl that was gang raped by her father and his friends and forced to act out the scenes from pornographic movies? I know that girl. Then she ends up with Grandview, and the male guards give her the same routine all over again. All over again. <laughs> and then there was another girl, I think she was about 14, and she was raped by four guys with a sawed-off shotgun, and they said if she told anybody that they'd blow her head off. So she's scared. She runs away from home. Well, they catch the guys and charge them, and what do they get? Like two years less a day, so eight months in prison? Nothing. She gets punished for running away from home and gets sent to Grandview for two years. She can't remember a thing. For well, two years, but she comes out of there like carved up like a Thanksgiving turkey. And that's when it hit me. She's still standing. She's still fighting. Yeah. If you guys can fight, then I can fight, because I'm not fighting alone. That's when I decided to go back to school, get my degree, stop throwing up, and I stopped shutting up. Now I have a body, and I have a mouth. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Ronnie, sometimes I'm still afraid. But because of you guys, I know I'm not alone. Hey! Hey, stop! Hey! Finally. Okay. And he doesn't like it when I'm late. 
Yeah, it likes it when you fail. <coughs> Check out what I got so far. <coughs> In 1933, the government of Ontario opened the Ontario Training School for Girls as a reform school. In reality, it was a prison. Yeah, okay. Violence, torture, rape. I read about it. Acts of solitary confinement had sensory deprivation. Physical, emotional, psychological, sexual abuse, that's rape, Gina, occurred on a regular basis. So confusing. In 1967, the government changed the name of the school to Grand View, which was, according to the superintendent, inspired by the magnificent view of the wooded valley from the school's perch on a hilltop. So that's where he's looking for folks being raped. The serious violence and abuse increased at Grand View when male guards were recruited to provide positive masculine role models for the attending girls. <coughs> What's wrong? Nothing. I'm just really late, okay? <laughs> so what? You missed your bus. What's the big deal? What do you think about this so far? About what you just read? Blah, 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 Don't touch me. What's the matter with you? Look, it's boring, okay? Why don't you just read the stupid article that you ripped that off from? Don't talk about Grandview from the outside. Talk about it from the inside. From here, in here, okay? What about the cunning? Did you ever want to cut yourself? Did you? Dr. Robert Ross, Grandview's head cheese, writes a stupid book about it, and he's one of the reasons why they're doing it. That's ironic, isn't it? And he's got tenure at Ottawa U. There's justice for you, a permanent paid position for a job well done. And what about the walking oh, wounded left behind? What about- Yeah, stop. You got to do this project with me. That was brutal. That was like, wow. <laughs> Why are you so interested in Grandview anyway? Never mind, I don't hardly even know you. <laughs> I've been researching Grandview for a really long time now. Oh really? You'd never guess. I mean, how long does it take to plagiarize? You've got to do this project with me. Please, please. Okay, it's boring, right? Who needs sleeping pills? Just listen to me talk for a while. I read this stuff to my dog Lucy every single night, and it puts her right out. Knock, knock. <clears throat> knock, knock. Who's there? Boring. Boring who? Boring everybody! Oh my god, that was so lame. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your bus? Meet me right here on Thursday and then we're going to your place. No, no, not my place. There's a boy I know who has a stutter and his mother shared a story with me not long ago that when she was coming to pick him up from school, as was typical for him, uh, he would be getting teased as he was walking to the car. And so uh, she realized that day that he was walking towards her in the parking lot and there were a couple of boys behind him uh, giving him a hard time saying, you stutter. And she watched him as he stopped and he turned around and he looked at them and he said, 
whoa, 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 what's your point? <laughs> There's a family that I know where, where, where two children are diagnosed with Tourette's and then one, fa one family member is diagnosed with OCD, obsessive uh, compulsive disorder, where at mealtime, when it comes time for meal prayer, what they do is they have a moment of silence for the normies. <laughs> There's a boy I know who, when he's walking down the street and, and people see his differences and, and they sort of snicker or point or jump or, or, or look a little scared across the street, he'll sort of look at me and he'll slap and shake his head and he says, oh, those are just the normal people. This evening's entitled Art with Attitude. Art with Attitude. Reflect on that latter component for a moment. I don't mean the typical somewhat negative connotation of attitude as in you'd better shape up your attitude, buddy. And I don't mean the attitude of others who may stare, point, judge, or chuckle at a difference. I mean the power of our own attitude to influence and mold the perceptions of others about us. The Tourette's Syndrome Foundation of Canada once conducted a study in which they asked individuals and families living with Tourette's to cite the most disabling aspect of the condition. Was it the noises? No. The movements? No. It was feeling socially isolated, feeling embarrassed, attitude. My own master's study explored severity of symptoms in a cluster of disorders and one's interpretation of those disorders as factors in successful coping. Severity was found to be unrelated to coping success. No correlation whatsoever. Zilch. Interpretation of disorder, though, explains significant amounts of the, the degree of success that you had. Attitude. Nothing can top a good attitude. You can't fake it. It oozes from every fiber of our being. A negative attitude can be your worst enemy, inflicting far more damage upon you than anyone else could ever hope to. And a positive attitude can trump the oddest mannerism, the absence of a sense or limb, a funky neurology, or the deepest psychological scars without even breathing hard. Up next, we have three men exploring. Those three men being Frank G. Hall, Alan Shane, and Kazumi Soroko. We'll be now treated to three structured improvised... Improvise, okay, there's a word in there somewhere. Improvisational... <laughs> pieces that are going to explore touch, relationship to self, and relationship to one another. These pieces are about the search for connectedness, intimacy, and meaning. The music will be a slow storm bruise by my friend the chocolate cake, and escape to the wilderness by Nature Nature, with special thanks to Rachel Gorman for initial development of these pieces. Three men exploring. Oh, no. 
I'm gonna put them here for a sec. I'll pick up my bathroom. Oh. I'm get these out of the way. No, I forgot to take them off. They get in the way. Footrests are such a pain. Oh. Yeah. Oh.
Did I not say you were going to see strength of spirit tonight, folks? That, that was just, I don't feel qualified to give a response to that. That was just simply one of the most awesome things I've ever seen in my life. to read to you a piece, folks, called Animal School. Once upon a time, the animals decided they must do something heroic to meet the problems of a new world. So they organized a school. They adopted an activity curriculum consisting of running, climbing, swimming, and flying. To make it easier to administer the curriculum, all the animals took all the subjects. The duck was excellent in swimming, in fact, better than his instructor was. But he made only passing grades in flying and was very poor in running. Since he was slow in running, he had to drop swimming and stay after school to practice running. This was kept up until his webbed feet were badly worn, and he was only average in swimming. But average was quite acceptable in school, so nobody worried about that. Except the duck. <laughs> the rabbit started at the top of his class in running, but had a nervous breakdown because of so much makeup work in swimming. The squirrel was excellent in climbing, but he developed frustrations in flying class because his teacher made him start from the ground up instead of from the treetop down. He developed Charlie horses from overexertion and then got C in climbing and D in running. The eagle was a problem child and was severely disciplined. In climbing classes, he beat all the others to the top of the tree, but insisted on using his own way to get there. At the end of the year, an abnormal eel that could swim exceedingly well and also run, climb, and fly a little, had the highest marks and was class valedictorian. The prairie dog stayed out of school and fought the tax levy because the administration would not add digging and burrowing to the curriculum. <laughs> they apprenticed their child to a badger and later joined the groundhogs and gophers to start an independent school. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, differently abled is not simply a euphemism for all of us to artificially bolster our collective self-esteem. It's a choice of how to interpret your situation. A disorder or a disability is not defined by having a physical or neurological difference. It's not defined by existing in an environment where people do not understand or know how to accommodate that difference. It's when and only when we match the two together, when what you are is incompatible with where you find yourself, that a problem arises. And so often, where we find ourselves has a whole lot to do with where we expect to find ourselves. Recognize that and you've recognized the key to having a difference versus being disordered. Sevens when we met At 19 I learned its name The doctor called it Tourette Said others had the same And on the bus ride back home I cried and cursed my life I wondered how I'd earned this Alone and in such strife I wanted it gone Asked the doctor for a pill But no matter what I tried This thing stayed with me still I begged to God for mercy I'd do anything he'd say 
as long as he would make this go away. But now I thank God for not answering that prayer, for born of all that pain was a whole lot of gain. Even though he didn't answer, it didn't mean he didn't care. God's greatest gift to me was leaving to red right there. I learned to understand it and made it my new friend. It wasn't the beast I'd first thought. It had strength to send. It taught me how to make the most of what you have and who you are. And armed with that frame of mind, you'll go so far. And as I stand here now with you, my family, I've met. For my success, I thank the good Lord. For the gift of Tourette. So now I thank God for not entering that prayer. For born of all that pain was a whole lot of gain. Even though he may not answer, it don't mean he don't care. God's greatest gift to me was leaving Tourette. God's greatest gift to me was just leaving to red. God's greatest gift to me was leaving to red right there. Thank you. We will now be treated to a five-minute comic dialogue featuring Doris Radjan and Spirit Sinnott. Doris is known for her outrageous risky humor and her wild energy. Spirit is a dancer, but tonight we're going to be treated to her theatrical work. God, I Love You People is an excerpt from the play still under development that we're going to see this evening. And Darlene Spencer will now give a short introduction to that. Good evening. What you're about to see this evening is a very short piece from a play that Doris is currently working on that we are in the process of adapting into a screenplay as well. The performers are Doris Rajan and Spirit Sinat. Uh, Doris and I first began working together about five years ago when we worked on her one-woman show that she wrote and performed in called <laughs> Doris Does Damage. And this, was, <laughs> and this was performed at the Toronto Fringe Festival, and then later we uh, taped it at Second City. And we've got sort of um, a film version of that, this as well. Uh, the piece this evening is a tangled tale that tells the story of Debbie, Doris, Debbie, Debbie, Doris, and the various people in her life at the point where she's just recently become <coughs> separated. So a scene from her new piece, God, I Love You People. Frank is so funny. He's so intense. He goes into these tangents, and everything is life or death. Like this morning, we were in a meeting, and he was trying to oh. tell us about... Excuse me. No, you know what? I'm not going to excuse you this time, nor will I laugh. Why is it that every single person in my life who is close to me feels so comfortable around me to just expel wind? Why is that, huh? Arlene, my brother-in-law, the children, particularly the boys. My mother, I mean, she can't help it. She's Indian, the spices. <laughs> what is this about? Can't we ever just have a nice conversation together? Why don't you people have any control? You're all sick. No. No, that's where you're wrong. You're the one that's not normal. Okay, Debbie, normal people fart. <laughs> In all the years I've known you, not once. No silent odor. No misplaced noise. <laughs> no once, nothing. Come to think of it. Oh, God, this is scary. Come to think of it, you can't even say the word fart. I have never heard you say the word fart. 
bar. Don't be ridiculous. You can't say it. You, you can't say it. You, not only can you not do it, you can't say it. Hey. <laughs> Is it too much to ask people to have a little consideration when in group situations... Say bar. Listening to it. It's her loss. She'll find out that soon. 
And who'll be crying then, huh? It's her goddamn loss. <laughs> Are you through, Fryvette? Actually, it was Lynn Franklin who spoke about the psychosocial consequences of society's definition no. of what is beauty in a woman, particularly in the context of gender and disability. Lynn Franklin, she's a bloody crip. What does she know? She knows quite a lot, actually. Much more than you. And quite frankly, I trade great issue with your continual usage of the term crip. Shut up, Patty. Our next performer is an absolute gem coming from the deaf community. I do not presume to claim any sort of expertise in this area. However, in my own anecdotal experience, I've been struck by the commonality of, of the deaf community with my own experiences. Let me explain what I mean here, uh, because I think it's a very powerful message. That message and, and the attitude I seem to share with, with, with members of this population, one that resonates throughout my own life, is that I'm happy just how I am. Thank you very much. That there are medications to suppress what I was meant to be, but why would I want to do that? There exist many positives in having the neurology I was blessed with. There also exist many positives in learning to see them. It's my understanding that a similar celebration of self exists within the deaf community, that one might resist the suggestion that a, a cochlear implant is necessary, as I would resist the suggestion that I require drugs. It changes who we're meant to be and in so doing diminishes us. I salute that sentiment and I also applaud the woman who is our next act for exemplifying this. Next we're going to see the One Deaf Woman comedy show about the behaviors of deaf and hearing people. Angela, uh, let's make sure I've got this right, I just learned this tonight. Angela Patron Strati is an internationally known performer and comedian. She's a native signer from a deaf family. She graduated from the Saskatchewan School for the Deaf and earned a BA in English from Gallaudet University and a Master's in Education in Deaf Education from Western Maryland College. She taught deaf students for two years in North Dakota and for 14 years at the Manitoba School for the Deaf in Winnipeg. Since 1986, Angela has been a coordinator, curriculum developer, and instructor in American Sign Language and Deaf Culture in the ASL English Interpreter Program and Sign Language Studies Program at Grant McEwen College in Edmonton, Alberta. She was a founding member of the Canadian Cultural Society of the Deaf and has been active in the society for 30 years. She was a consultant on the American Sign Language and Canada Dictionary and is a co-author of Deaf Women Canada. Her first public release on video was Pursuit of ASL, Interesting Facts Using Classifiers, produced by Dr. Marty Taylor, interpreting Consolidated in 1998. Deaf Utopia is her business and website. Through it, she offers workshops on ASL and deaf culture. Also, she offers solo comedy shows, to which we'll be treated tonight. Angela dreams of a better world for deaf people, away from the obstacles in our everyday lives. An ideal world is free of oppression, discrimination, and misconceptions. Here's what a few different people have had to say about Angela. Angela has a very dry wit, and her satirical sketches of hearing persons going about their daily business are deadly and often hysterical. Roger Carver, Vancouver. 
Her act gives insight into the deaf world from the deaf world's perspective. Her humor often requires Kleenex to dab the tearing eyes because of all the laughter. That one came from Edmonton. Here's one from San Diego, the Deaf Women United Society. Strati should be declared an honorary Deaf American treasure. My friends, Angela. Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all here. Hang on a second. I need to see where my deaf friends are. Can people who are deaf please raise their hands? Oh, I feel so much better and so safe at home now. And now all of the rest of you here are, I'm going to refer to you as hearing people. And what I mean is you hear and you make those weird m movements with your lips they call speech. And, and with those, those odd sounds that come from your throat. So I'm going to refer to you over the course of the next few minutes as either non-deaf or hearing. Now when you think, think about the TV show, I'm sure you're familiar with it, The Third Rock from the Sun, the aliens arrive on Earth and do their studies of human behavior. I've done the similar kind of thing. I've studied hearing specimens over the last little while. <laughs> now historically, it's often been assumed that deaf people can't. If you can't hear, then it means you couldn't possibly be successful. You couldn't be a professional person. You, if you can't talk well, you can't do anything else. And this is the, the kind of oppressive feeling that we've often received from hearing people over the years as people who are deaf. Because we can't hear, there's been uh, numerous efforts to try and repair that by giving us hearing aids and all these efforts to fix us. So I decided to do some research on the difference between hearing or not and the kinds of behaviors that go on. I have these papers right here, documented evidence. I'm, I'm also checking in with my interpreter, making sure she's keeping up all right. So, the research. I don't, I'm not so sure if you hearing people are all that much smarter than we are. I've come to the conclusion that maybe at times you're a little slow. I found that you're slow at times, you're slow learners. What? So I, I realize what a powerful thing sound is in your lives. A very powerful thing. It controls everything that you do. When you eat, if there was no music in a restaurant, you wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> That's why they have music. Sound makes you go to the bathroom. You turn on the radio, listen to something, it gives you a clue. Oh, got to go to the bathroom. When you go to work in the morning, you've got to have that radio on. These are things that I've learned over the, over the years that sound is everywhere and what a controlling thing it is for hearing people. I do these things on a normal daily basis, get my car, go to work, do all these things without any sound to tell me to do it. Now I realize then when I see somebody arrive at work late, that means obviously that the radio is not working because they haven't been able to get themselves up and out the door on time. <laughs> now I said before that I had come to the conclusion that hearing people are slow learners. I have some evidence I'd like to share with you about that. We deaf folks don't own radios, don't use them. We get up in the morning because of a clock that has a flashing light and that gets us up and moving. And we know how to get to the bathroom without having to turn on the radio. We go there, we do our business, we go to the kitchen, get our breakfast and off we head to work. But hearing people on the other hand, it's a radio that wakes you up in the morning. So the alarm is actually nice, gentle music to get you up and going. At the, to the sound of that music or the radio show, you wander into the bathroom, brush your teeth, in the kitchen, turn on another radio so that you know that you need to eat your breakfast. <laughs> Get in the car. First thing you do be, when you, after you start the engine is turn that radio on so that you know how to drive, which roads to take to get to work. <laughs> now, I realize, too, that something import, an important element on the radio is the news programs that they have and the weather updates every half hour. I'll often ask my, my, my hearing friends at, at work, what are you listening to on the radio? Oh, the weather report, the news report. Oh. An hour later, I see them sitting, doing the work at their desk. 
What are you listening to on the radio? The weather. The news. And then you turn on the TV, and how many times during the day is there an update on the news and the weather again and again all day long? Clearly, you must be slow. You've got to hear this information repeated over and over and over all day long before you actually know what the news and the weather is. You see what I mean? It would appear that you're slow. Deaf people don't do this. They get up in the morning, flip on the TV for a few minutes, perhaps, or open the newspaper and have a look and see. Let's see. Okay, what's the temperature? What am I going to wear today? That's it. That's it. We don't get the news again until we get home in the evening after work is done. We're not listening to the radio all day long. It's not until we get home in the evening, check out the news, 6 o'clock. You know, so you compare two news bulletins, morning and evening, to what, 15, 16, all day long? (laughs) Something going on there. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry that you have such difficulty processing the information. (laughs) I've learned an awful lot over the years about sound and how meaningful and important it is. Now take a look at this styrofoam cup, for example. A wonderful little invention. Put your coffee in there, keeps it hot. It's very light. Handy thing. Now hearing people also appreciate the value of a, an invention like a styrofoam cup, but hate it because of the sound it makes. I should put the microphone up beside the... So, because I know it'll make you squirm in your chair at the squeaky styrofoam sound. I've seen people do this. You pick a pick a piece of styrofoam, and people start to wriggle and shake. It's amazing the reaction. I discovered this going to a meeting. I was sitting around a boardroom table with a number of people, all of them hearing except for myself. I drank my coffee, and out of boredom, started tearing the cup in tiny little pieces, and I noticed some very strange expressions on the people's faces around the table, particularly the interpreter. Very pained expressions. Now, you know, I thought that it would be very quiet. I just picked a little bit. <laughs> no, never mind. We won't go there. <laughs> but I thought I was be- be quietly passing the time, and it wasn't until somebody said that I should stop. It hurts our ears to hear that sound. Well, I'll be. I didn't know that. So from now on, I always make sure to bring a styrofoam cup to all the... <laughs> to all the meetings that I go to with hearing people so that if they're boring, I can get it wrapped up faster. (laughs) Now, I think I could probably categorize hearing people into five different groups based on the different reactions people have to music. Take, for example, if you go to a bar where there's music or if you're going to a social party where music's playing or many kind of event like that. I love to sit back at these things and watch people and pick which group that they're in. Put the music on. First, the first group are the people who respond to music with their head. They look like this. <laughs> they got to get the lip action in there. Oh yeah, baby. It's fascinating to see the head bobbers, I call them. And then there's another category, and they get the upper body moving. This is what they look like. (laughs) Third category, then, they get the whole action going from head to toe. Here we go. (laughs) Fourth category are the foot tappers. It's all the moves, just the feet. No head, no arms, no nothing, just the toes. Tip-tap. And then the last group are the stone statues. (laughs) They don't move at all. Not a muscle. So which which one of you would consider yourselves the category one, the head bobbers? Hands up. Who's a head bobber? All righty. And category number two from the waist up and the arms. Uh Uh-huh. Good, good. And category three, where you get the whole thing going head to toe. <laughs> Full body. And then the fourth, the fourth category, toe tappers. Who's a toe tapper? Uh-huh, we got a few of those. And stone statues. Who's a stone statue? Doesn't move to the sound of music. 
We got one honest soul back there anyway. This is something that I've learned that not all hearing people have good rhythm. I thought you can hear the music, you must have natural rhythm. I thought that that would just be a foregone conclusion. Apparently not. Deaf people can dance, have rhythm, but eh, well, there you go. One of my favorite places to sit back and watch my subjects, hearing people, is on an airplane. And I realize that the reason they have uh, attendance, flight attendants on an airplane is to help hearing people. They're the ones who need the help. <laughs> As a deaf person, I always get to board early. I inform them that I'm deaf and I get the early boarding pass. And it takes an awful long time to wait for all the hearing people to board on. So I <laughs> sit down and I have an opportunity to, sub to, to, to study the behaviors of hearing people. <laughs> so I have no trouble getting in on the plane, finding my seat, I sit down and I watch. I watch the hearing people file in. And they have their boarding card. And here's what they look like. They've got their over carry-on case and a jacket and a bunch of stuff. I guess the problem is they didn't hear the weather all day, so they don't know when they get to their destination what kind of coat or what kind of clothing they're going to need, so they have to pack 20 items into the over, overhead bin. So I'm sure you've... Well, you may not know this, actually. It's, the rows are numbered, one, two, three, from the beginning of the plane to the back, and then the seats from left to right are A, B, C, D, E, F. But this is what people do on a plane when they're trying to find their seat. I love watching them. The struggle, trying to figure out which row and which seat. That's why planes are always late. <laughs> they're late taking off because it takes so long for hearing people to find their seats. It takes those flight attendants to serve people one at a time to get them settled into each and every seat. Uh, it takes a good 20, 25 minutes for that process to be sorted out. And I, I suppose maybe you've noticed first class has a curtain on it usually. The people who sit in first class, they're the slowest of the lot. <laughs> That's why they close the curtain. They need a lot of special attention up there in first class. Finding the seat is a very difficult business. So they try to do that with, give them a little privacy. I have a demonstration of what I see when I watch the flight attendants doing their demonstrations at the beginning of a flight. You've seen them with this instrument. They have to explain how a seatbelt is fastened because I guess you don't know how to do it. <laughs> hey, you've, you've seen that? You've seen the demonstration before on an airplane? Now, I would have thought that that would have been automatic behavior for people because it's exactly the same as getting into your car and putting on your seatbelt. But in any case, you've also seen this. All the picture diagrams for people who have difficulty understanding simple material printed so that in case of an emergency, you know what to do. And then they demonstrate the uh, oxygen masks. I love the sign language they use on a plane. Show you where the doors are, where the lights are on the uh, aisle. Another thing I found very fascinating is hearing behavior on the telephone. This is, I've come to the conclusion, a hearing person's favorite toy. <laughs> life, all information about life is transmitted but through this machine to some other person on the other end. Very, very important piece of equipment. And I've noticed that it causes disabilities. If, when a hearing person picks up a telephone, and puts it to their ear, they become blind. <laughs> I've often gone past hearing friends of mine on the phone, wave to them to try and get their attention. They can't see me at all. They've gone completely blind. I could be naked. I could be standing there with my, my fly open. They can't see a thing if they've got the phone in their ear. <laughs> hearing women on the phone have a unique set of behaviors. I'm going to demonstrate this so you can just watch. You won't need to listen to the interpreter. 
<laughs> and then there's little adjustments that have to go on before they actually start talking. In a bit of a bad mood, but then all of a sudden... about do you think the person on the other line end of the line can actually see what you're doing pointing and waving around <laughs> take a look at other people's houses you'll see teeth marks in everybody's cord you'll see it it's there everybody chews on the cord don't blame the dog it hasn't been the dog doing it This is my favorite part. You always know when the end of the conversation is coming. Uh-huh. <laughs> because the head gets closer to the, the handset. Oh, no, upright means there's more to be said. <laughs> hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, all right, bye-bye. Bye-bye, <laughs> down, lower, lower. Oh, Really? All right, bye-bye, bye-bye, lower, lower, and finally, hanging up. <laughs> Men do some pretty strange things. There are other strange things that go on with the telephone as well. I've noticed this writing behavior that happens while people are on the phone. I don't know what your paper looks like, but I think this is pretty common. <laughs> Ah, now we've got some evidence of some anger disorders here. We've got these words that are being expressed. I don't know. Now men, on the other hand, are a little different when they use the telephone. They don't have a whole lot to say generally when they get on the phone. They tend to be pretty short and sweet about it all. They don't mind farting or burping while they're on the phone. (laughs) That's all right then. And then when the woman picks up the phone on the other end, they suck it in. Uh Uh-huh. No. Uh Uh-huh. All right. Uh (laughs) I've observed that sort of thing with men quite, quite frequently. Now, remember I mentioned before that um, a telephone can make you blind? Well, the research now has actually proven this with cell phones and driving. So, you know, you don't want to be using your, your cell phone while you're in the car because it, it's, it's a very serious problem. And uh, you can't see it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a bad thing. So. <laughs> One of my favorite things is to watch hearing people on a bus. If they've dropped uh, a friend off at the bus stop and, or perhaps at the train, when they can't communicate because one person is in the train or on the bus looking out through the window. I don't know if you've ever... Have you ever seen people doing this or have you done it yourself trying to talk to somebody? It's easy for us deaf folks. One's in the train, one's outside. You can still have a conversation through the window with ASL. Not a problem. <laughs> but hearing people look like this... <laughs> these bizarre exaggerated gestures going on and the mouth movements it's crazy <laughs> I notice that hearing beha- people behave very strangely when they get in an elevator uh, and I think that's the music that causes them to turn to stone they're just not comfortable unless they're standing with with their back to the back of the elevator facing forward so that they don't have to talk to anybody. So you go in and you push a button. (coughs) Hearing people get in and they become completely motionless. They've got to look up at those numbers and count them carefully. One, two, three. It's like they've 
turn to ice or something. They're completely frozen standing there. I think they're really worried about missing their floor because they've got to really pay attention to those numbers. It's tricky stuff, you know? I don't know. I don't know. Need the music so that they, they'll feel better and know when to get off. I went to a meeting one time where there were a number of VIPs present, members of parliament and very hoity-toity folks that were there meeting and greeting, talking, shaking hands, doing the, doing the social butterfly routine. And I thought, this is going to be interesting when they come around the room to meet me. So I watched them. And I was towards the end of the circulation around the room, and they were talking, and, hi, how you doing? How's it going? My first gesture was to point to my ear, meaning that I was deaf. And, Mm-mm. They were stunned. <laughs> they had no idea how to respond to me, had no idea what to do. You, oh, you, you, can't, you can't hear? No, no, I can't. Uh, uh-huh. Uh. And they looked absolutely helpless. You know, I had to go then, call an interpreter and save their butts so that they could have the conversation. So when you meet a deaf person, don't go into shock like that. Pull out a piece of paper, write a little note. You know, we're really all the same when it all comes down to it. That's it for me. Thanks very much. A man was on vacation. He, he, was, he was a businessman. He, you know one of these hoity-toities that we were just talking about that was fairly burned out, getting pretty cynical, jaded with the world, and he just, close to burnout, he needed a break. So he went someplace with a lot of water, Oceanside, and rented a bungalow. And he gets up the first morning, and, and he's got a lot on his mind. He's, he's still pretty, you know, he, his head's still back in the city. And so he decides he'll go for a walk down the beach just to try and clear his head a little bit and work out some of his, what seemed to him, monumental problems. So he's taking a walk down the beach, and the first thing he noticed actually is a beautiful sunsets coming up over the horizon. He's not noticing that. Uh, you know, the, the, the wonderful smell of the sea air, not noticing that. What he does notice is that there are thousands and thousands of starfish littering the beach. Because what's happened, of course, is that the tide had come in overnight, and all these starfish had come up with the water. And now that the tide's gone out, a lot of these starfish were left then stranded on the beach. And as the sunset, uh, as the sun, beautiful sunset ended and the sun rose, uh, they, they were, they were going to bake on the beach and they were going to die. And, and he noticed this just because he was tripping over a lot of them and they were just sort of a nuisance. And his brow furrowed even further and he you know, kicked a couple out of his way as he's walking along. As he gets a little further down the beach, he notices a speck in the distance. And, and he can't quite make out what it is, but whatever it is, it's busy. Seems to be running back and forth and all over the beach. And so he's a little curious. He picks up his pace a little bit, get, get, gets his head out of, the, out of the depressing place it's in for the moment. And so he, he decides to, uh, to explore a little bit. And so as he gets further down the beach, he realizes it's a young boy. And what's the young boy doing? He's running up the beach. He's grabbing starfish, as many as he can. He's piling them into his shirt, and he's running down to the water, and he's throwing the starfish back into the water, and back up again, and back and forth. Just, you know, sweat running down the brow, but just tirelessly, back and forth, back and forth. And, and the man just sort of snickers a little bit, thinking, that's pathetic. And as he gets a little bit closer to the boy, he says, what are you doing? The boy says, well, hey, can't you see, mister? Can, maybe can, you can help me. All these starfish, they're going to die, and, and I want to get them back in the water. And, and, and so let's, you know, help me pick them up, mister, and we'll get them back in the water. And he just sort of laughs again. He, he puts his arm around the boy and says, see here, son. I mean, this is futile. Look up this, you know, as far as the eye can see, starfish. Look down here. As far as the eye can see, starfish. There's thousands of them. You can't possibly save them all. You can't make a difference. Give up. And the light in the boy's eyes dims for a second as he considers what the man has said to him. As he looks down at the ground and ponders it for a second, he sees a starfish by his feet. So he stoops down, and he picks up the starfish, and he walks over with a thoughtful expression on his face to the water and throws that single starfish into the water. And he turns around, and he looks at the man, and he says, I made a difference to that one. How many starfish has an Angela Strayi thrown back into the water? A Frank Hull. A Ruth Ruth. How many can you? Our collective power on an evening such as this, the influence we each can wield, just boggles the mind. 
I wanted to let you know before we got to our last act that um, Angela Strayi will be selling uh, videos of a performance much like the one you saw tonight. Uh, uh, they'll be available after the show. They'll be available for $30, and there's no GST, there's no shipping and handling. Uh, the normal cost is $39.99 plus those extras, but uh, you, can, you can snag it for the, for the low, low price of $30 tonight. We're now going to be treated to a multimedia extravaganza by Alex Balmer, our last act of the evening. Uh, it works with music, spoken word, and video images from a film of her own made a few years ago. Alex, who is blind, is a theater artist. She has worked as a professional actor for several companies in Canada and abroad. She is best known and respected for a play she wrote and co-produced a couple of years ago entitled Smudge. It played at the Tarragon and was quite a success, receiving considerable critical acclaim. Alex also teaches voice. She's taught here in Toronto, in England, and also at the National Theatre School in Montreal. She met and worked with her first disability troupe called Grey ten years ago. Very fortunately for us, a decade later, she's still going strong. This is a whole new piece she's created tonight. It's called The Mirror Dance. And it consists of movement, text, and dance. Oh yeah, and some comedy. In her words, it's a whole mixed bag. Distinguished guests, I give you Alex.
Oh, Molly, it's such a tragedy you can't play the volleyball. Oh, Molly, don't go out of the house. You'll get, you'll get squished by a moving car. <laughs> well, how many people get squished by a car that's not moving? <laughs>
much, ladies. This brings our show to an end, ladies and gentlemen. What fun we've had. What, what fun we've had. What synergy we've experienced. We've laughed, we've cried, and we've learned. I hope you've enjoyed this time with us as much as we've enjoyed sharing it with you. Again, first and foremost, thank you to the Royal Bank of Canada for their generous grant that has made all of this possible. Thank you to our audio men, Mike Graham from Ryerson Media Services and Steve Hostin. Hot stun, sorry. Thank you to our camera women at the back, Hee Ju Yoon, for handling the video recording of this phenomenal night. Thank you to Dan Baker from the Ryerson Theatre Department who provided lighting. Thank you to our fantastic, fabulous interpreters from Stagehands Unlimited. They are Penny Shinkario, Gus Mancini, in association with Janet Null. Thank you to Paris Mc, uh, Master McRae and Patricia Seeley for handling an enormous load of administrative and organizational details. Thank you to Garth Poppleton for custodial services. Thank you to the Cuisinart in the other room. Thank you, Sam. And finally, thank you to all of you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your time. And thank you for choosing to look at that starfish scattered on the beach of your life, for stooping down, and for giving it a hand. Refreshments will be served in the lobby. Please enjoy yourselves and have a safe and pleasant trip home. Good night. <laughs>